Bath. Welcome to the first of our Somerville Stay at Home discussions. We're starting with a real treat, a conversation with the wonderful Dame Esther Ranson, eminent journalist and broadcaster, founder of Childline, the amazing national helpline for children who need help, advice and support, and founder of the Silver Line for elderly people to combat isolation and loneliness. Both charities are always in great demand, but I imagine that their workload at the moment must be absolutely huge. Esther is a truly extraordinary woman, and most significantly, she came to Somerville, where she read English. I'm not sure how diligent she was as a student. She admitted on Desert Island Discs that the day after her finals, she appeared in the importance of being earnest and knew all of her lines. But she must have been enthusiastic about her time at Somerville because her son is also a Somervillian. Last year, Esther spoke to us very powerfully at an, an event entitled Connecting in the Disconnected Age. And today I wanted to pick up on some of those threads now that we're living through the most profound period of enforced disconnection that we've ever known. So Esther, welcome. You're a people person. You love life. In this difficult and rather frightening world of COVID-19 and isolation, how have you been and what have you been up to? Can you hear me now? You can. No, we can. Your... So, you... what have you been up to? What have I been up to? I have been reflecting on how mad I've been for my previous 79 and three quarter years in thinking that being busy was the same as, well, living really. Um, actually, all those days, bounced out of bed by my alarm and then hurling myself into my car, which I must, um, uh, to defend myself, say is a hybrid car, but that doesn't that doesn't excuse it. Working my way through London traffic to get to a committee meeting, which lasts four hours, where you're lucky to get five minutes for a curling sandwich in the middle, and then at the end of it, forcing my way through the traffic, working out whether it would have made any difference if I was there or not. And instead of that, I've been watching the spring arrive and thinking this is so beautiful. And this is such a privilege. So I know I'm lucky because I've got a garden. I know I'm lucky because I'm with my daughter. But it has made me reflect on whether I've been doing it all wrong for 79 and a half years. Well, I mean, I think that's a great lesson for us all, isn't it? Being busy is not the same as living. Um, I think that that is something that everybody after this uh, pandemic is going to go away with that lesson. But thank you for sharing that. So you've had a long and distinguished career with the BBC. What role do you think broadcasters have got to play in a crisis like this? And have they done enough? Well, I think it's been a very crucial information role, hasn't it? Keeping us up to date with those frightening charts that always seem to be heading in the wrong direction. Um, I'm quite interested in the way they make politicians accountable, which of course they must. And the tone they adopt, I, I'm actually a sort of fan of Piers Morgan, who you probably have never heard of, Dan, but he um, <laughs> shouts at people early in the morning. And it's not the content of his questions that I object to. I think they're right. But the way he stridently interrupts in a sort of bullying way, and I'm very entertained by the way that has caught on as a style. It seems to be the only acceptable way of interviewing. And I've always been interested in the fact that David Frost got the most out of his politicians. Yeah, he did. By gently inserting a difficult question in a, an interested tone of voice, as against repeating the same question 12 times, which is, I think, what Jeremy Paxman got his BAFTA award for. So I think, yes, they've been doing a good job. They've been providing information. I've gone off, I'm afraid, Channel 4 News, because they are so angry. 
a reporter presenter stands looking at you extremely gloomily and saying, have you seen some dreadful outrage that is happening somewhere? And to be perfectly honest with you, I have seen, yes, there are outrages happening everywhere. This is a virus no one knew about six months ago. So people are catching up with great difficulty, with varied results all over the world. And we will be able to look at this as a sort of scientific control experiment when it's finished. But Channel Floor is really, I think, just one degree too depressing for me. Captain Tom, on the other hand, is providing a wonderful remedy for the idea that people over the age of 55 haven't got any value anymore and one person cannot make a difference. He is a one-man embodiment of the fact that someone of 100 years old can make a huge difference to the nation's morale. I'm glad that because as somebody who's 64, I want to make a difference for a, a long time in the future. But I also think you're right about the the role that politicians have, pl sorry, that that the press has played in holding politicians to account, especially when Parliament hasn't been sitting. What keeps you awake at night? Climate change, social justice, or fake news, or maybe something else during this pandemic? Climate change keeps me awake. Um... I've been getting more and more concerned about climate change as the months have gone by because the contrast with the time before the pandemic, when there was pollution everywhere, noise everywhere, you could barely hear a bird song. And now when the skies are clear and the roads are clear and the birds are quite deafening night and morning, and I think to myself, how are we ever going to replicate this voluntarily? We can do it if it's life and death immediately. But one of those behavioral psychologists said that's what humanity does. If they can actually see the danger, if they're standing on the edge of a cliff, then they may protect themselves. But if they can't see it, they do what I like to call a Trump scenario and find someone to blame and think it, it's never going to happen anyway. Mm. I completely agree with you. So charities, a lot of your life has been working with and founding charities. What role do they have to play in responding to the pandemic? I think charities have become really more important than ever and more vulnerable than ever. Because many of them are niche charities which have diagnosed a particular need in a particular section of society and a way of resolving it or helping to contribute to a solution, I think they're really important because I think what we've seen is that local communities work very well in targeting the people who need help the most. But of course, charity shops are shut, fundraising events have mm. been, had to be cancelled. So how we can restore the voluntary sector, I don't know, particularly when they're losing. If you'll pardon me harping on a theme, some of the most valuable workers who are 70 plus. I know that Childline has had to ask our 70 plus voluntary volunteer counsellors not to come into our bases because we can't keep them at a safe distance from each other. And that means we've lost 60% of our counsellors yeah. and we've had to close down our night service. So isn't that interesting that some of our most reliable, conscientious, long-serving volunteers for child life, and I know the same is true of things like RVS and probably true of Samaritans and others, they're 70 pluses. So at least it means we value them, even if it has meant we've had to lose them. We certainly do, but I hope that it, students perhaps can start filling that gap, that huge gap which is being left. You're passionate uh, and an advocate about social inclusion, greater social inclusion for older people. And you've spoken about the importance of connecting in the disconnecting, disconnected age. Did you, do you think that this crisis will leave us more disconnected at the end of it? Or do you think we're going to be more connected? And what are the benefits from such a pandemic, if there are any? I'm hoping that some of the new links are going to be strong enough to survive health and aren't only going to be there during the crisis of the pandemic. For example, 
quite a lot of the older people who ring the silver line who haven't normally had contact with anybody are beginning to find that neighbors are offering help in buying mm. food in getting medication and the other thing is, I, had, I was talking to the Rotary, uh, a, a Rotary Club about the Silver Line, and one of the members said that what he's done is he's made a list of all the people he knows he should have rung up long ago and never did. People in his family, people among his colleagues and ex-colleagues, people who used to be friends and should still be friends. He's made a list of them and he has rung them up. And he says that what he thought would be a five minute conversation has turned into a half hour conversation. And maybe we'll do that on a regular basis. Maybe we'll understand that the telephone is actually one of the most potent ways of expressing emotion, of joining up with people, sharing humor, sharing memories. And uh, maybe those links will keep going. I hope they do. That's a great message of hope. Thank you. So if you could change one thing in the world when we emerge from this ghastly pandemic, what would it be? Well, I'm afraid it would go back to climate because I think that is the long-term threat to humanity. Mm. I think we haven't been a great species. We've taken over, we're top of the food chain. We've managed to eradicate a whole lot of animal and plants who actually we will miss probably. But worst of all, we've been throwing stuff into the air that was never intended to go there. And as a result, we are putting our lives and the lives on the whole planet at risk. It's not the end of the world, literally, because um, James Lovelock, whom I greatly admire, says that the planet will survive. He was the first person, as you probably know, to draw attention to climate change. But um, he says the planet will survive, it's just that we won't. So, uh, or probably most of us won't, but something will. And I'm, I'm wondering to myself what the next species is going to be. And I hope they're a little bit more sensible if we get it wrong. But it would be lovely if we came out of this realizing that we are fragile, we are vulnerable. And if we want to continue and our grandchildren to continue, we've got to do something about the climate. Yeah. We will. We must, but we will. So this term, most of our students are working from home, including those with exams. What are some of your memories of being a finalist at Somerville? And what do you consider the essential ingredients of a good Somerville celebration? Because at the end of this, or when we can stop social distancing, we are going to celebrate. Well, I managed to get a much better degree than I deserved. I managed to get what they called in those days a good second. I've no idea how good. But anyway, that's why they said I got it. And my secret was, in those days, I read English, was uh, not to bother with critics or reading around, but I had a friend of mine who analysed all the final papers for the previous 10 years and worked out which author they could not help but ask you about. And if I'd never read a word of them, and I actually haven't written, I somehow managed to get to my final year without having read a word of Dickens. I've read them from scratch. And then, and then immediately before each exam, I would walk around the botanical gardens or somewhere with one of those books in my hand, just familiarizing my short-term memory, what it sounded like. And by appearing in the importance of being earnest opposite Peter Snow, oh. the three days after the um three days after the final paper i knew my part i was word perfect and i managed to work it in to every answer i had <laughs> so that's my that's my recipe don't please pay attention to me i mean that's i should think these days examiners are far more um, aware of um, the gaps in students knowledge but um i got away with it well, it sounds like you had a lady luck on your shoulder as well as anything else. So finally, a Desert Island Discs question. If you were allowed one lockdown luxury, what is it? And have you indulged in such a luxury yet? I think my lockdown luxury... Oh, that's good. It's um, Alliteration is rather fun. My luck... Lockdown luxury is a Labrador. 
Oh. I had one once. I adored him. He was called Arthur. He was a black Labrador. He was so empathetic. If I was miserable, he'd come and sit on my feet in a sort of comforting way. And if I was cheerful, he would lollop around and obediently pretend he was interested in the sticks I was throwing him. And uh, I adored him so much I couldn't replace him. Maybe I feel that way about men too. Who knows? We won't go there. <laughs> um, no, don't go there. <laughs> and I might replace the Labrador. Might, one day. I think that sounds a good idea because you never know when the next pandemic is going to come along, do we? Anyway, we've run out of time. Thank you so much, Esther. That was a fantastic interview and it's just a great start to our Somerville at Home series. Thank you so much. Great pleasure. Stay safe, Jan, and all Somervillians, please don't follow my advice. But stay <laughs> safe. Do stay safe. We probably won't. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.